Research conducted by various organizations has shown a significant increase in food prices recently. Months into the lockdown, a study by Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice showed that basic food items cost 30% more than they did before. While this was partly attributed to a disruption in international supply chains and the weak economy, retailers had also been deliberately hiking prices as found by the Competition Commission. And although the Commission says that prices have uh, now somewhat stabilized, consumers are still feeling the pinch. To discuss this further, we are now joined by Professor Mari Lebrand, the Director of the Southern African Labor and Development Research Unit at the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town, who is joining us via Skype. A very good morning to you, Professor. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Well, apart from retailers increasing the prices themselves, what other factors uh, you reckon have been behind the high food inflation? Well, South Africa is in, in the fortunate position to be producing most of its food. So uh, one really needs to drive back from the retailers to uh, those supplying the food all the way along the food chain. One can analyze, for example, in the example, the farmers growing the wheat, and then you've got the millers who, who mill the, the wheat into, uh, into flour, and then you've got the bread producers who produce the bread, and then they sell it to the, the, uh, the supermarkets and the uh, small stores. And um, the Competition Commission, in making its, its findings, can look all the way along the food chain. We we prices in South Africa, so we do have quite um, quite good information on these prices. Uh, and then, of course, there's like transport. For example, when transport goes up, it goes all the way along the chain. So that's how the the Competition Commission does its work. It traces those prices along the chain and looks at where do the increases lie. So the, uh, the finding by Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice uh, or, or their reporting on the Competition Commission's finding was really to say that the hike took place at the retailers themselves. But then do you, do you reckon that suppliers and uh, retailers are justified in their argument that, uh, you know, the food price hike was attributed to uh, the international or rather to a disruption uh, in the international supply chains and the weak economy? Well, the rand hasn't done well. So whenever any sector in our economy is, is subject to... Uh, to that, uh, uh, w w whenever they're exposed to importing goods, then there is price pressure. Um, and so that's, uh, that is an acceptable argument. It's, it's not a huge part of the South supply chain, though. Uh, and um, I guess my, my substantive point on that, though, is that we do know these price informations and we could manage this uh, um, in a way that it's it's open cards. So the Competition Commission is looking at these prices all the way along and it's sensitive to these uh, imported, if you like, imported price increases. Um, the, the, the retailers know that they're absolutely central to us coping with COVID. To, they're central to the responses in terms of uh, vulnerabilities of everyday South Africans. And so there's another way to go here where one just is very transparent about all of this. Um, and uh, in, in a sense, it sets the example. We're asking for more transparency from government and we can absolutely do this. We can, we can put our cards on the table and show South Africa what we're dealing with because we're dealing with this thing collectively. And certainly, certainly, Professor. And now that the lockdown regulations have somewhat eased and uh, in, in other countries as well, and more industries are now open, how is the economy performing right now? Well, it's uh, obviously we're, do, we're doing the best we can. And it's a collective effort. Uh, it's, it's not doing fantastically, especially for the, the poorer and most vulnerable households in, in the economy. They work in sectors that, um, that are, are particularly prone to job loss, actually. And so all the statistics show that the people who've actually lost their jobs and so come back into employment immediately are from the vulnerable sectors. And so uh, the, the economy 
is, is not doing well in terms of the poor in South Africa. It's putting immense stress. And it comes right back to what we're talking about this morning because it's about money to buy food. Um, and uh, uh, so if you think about that, uh, the people losing the jobs are the people who are most, uh, who are most in need of the cash to buy the food. If you think about our country's response to the even under lockdown, uh, we, our emergency response was to increase social grants somewhat and a special COVID grant. That was to put money in the hands of, of poor South Africans uh, because we recognise that we don't have an elaborate food supply system in this country, like, for example, India, that can actually distribute food. We, we do have a big campaign to get food parcels out, but we understand that most South Africans buy food so the food price is a key price in the economy. Um, I can, uh, so, and so the poor have been taking strain, and that's uh, that's part of of what the the Peter Maritzburg group is is trying to highlight here. Um, if I can give you how they're taking strain, so the Peter Maritzburg group estimates that they're spending about nine hundred rand a month on food. Uh, the the statistics South Africa tell. In February 2020, the food poverty line, which is the amount of money you need to buy basic nutrients to actually flourish, is 580 rand per person. And uh, that's just to buy the basic foodstuffs that you need. And uh, But the average incomes of South Africans is, are nowhere near that amount. They're nowhere near 900 rand or even 500 rand uh, in the poorest sector. And so there's a, there's a food crisis in a sense that's mediated through through buying food and it becomes a, a vicious cycle of uh, of poverty as we've seen in the past few months uh, where there's an unavailability of certain uh, you know essential food items and we just given rise to the black market and when people have you know people start stocking up on food items and then reselling those food items at ridiculously high prices uh, thus giving rise to the black market and the black market prices it suffers to suffices to mention that most south africans cannot afford paying those prices, isn't it? Exactly. That's that's such a good point that you just made. So so the, the reason why I gave you those statistics about how much it actually costs to buy a basic bundle of food and uh, one more statistic is that uh, obviously the poorest spend much higher percentages of their total income on food. It's it's 45% of, of your total income at the bottom end, at the very, very least. Um, and so your point about uh, about the the, the uh, people jacking up the prices of food is the perspective that we need to bring to bear here is some mother trying to look after their family and be a good mother, be a good mom um, in the current environment, and they're battling, and they really, you know, so so when people do that. And, and they've got to adjust, and under lockdown, they had to buy from the nearest retailer, so they didn't have the capacity to go and look for cheaper food, etc. So they're very vulnerable. So this price gouging, if you like, around food is exactly the same level of, of corruption as, um, as what we're complaining about in the supply of, of healthcare services to government. It's, we, we just can't have it at the current moment. It's absolutely mm. immoral. Mm. And having said that, has this had any effect on reducing the cost of food? The, the Competition Commission. I mean, the whole, uh, you know, the whole weak economy and the fact that the black market, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, reigns supreme in South Africa, does it have any effect on, the, on reducing the cost of food? Well, it, it, it does have an effect on the cost of food and it makes it harder for those moms to actually be as resourceful as they can be. Um, and so the issue comes up, that's why the Competition Commission investigates, but the, but the focus would tend to be on the big retailers, et cetera, uh, rather than us as South Africans, all of those supplying food into the market. Um, and so the issue comes up about price control, but that's, uh, it's a very tricky issue right now in the country, we absolutely have to get back to the fact that we're managing this crisis together. And people need to understand that the food price 
Food prices are absolutely key to our adjustment, to keeping people alive, to keeping people healthy enough to go to school and be productive when we get back to school, uh, etc. It's a key price and it's a key interface between our households and the economy to in the interview interface. But we've all got our role to play here. And speaking of the Competition Commission, how important is the role of this commission? And are you at all impressed uh, with how they've executed their mandate? We've seen uh, in, in the past few weeks uh, cracking down on uh, illegally, uh, you know, on the illegal high, high prices of food. Yes, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed with the Competition Commission. I return to a point I made at the beginning. We have very detailed price information. Um, and so we can do these studies and we should be doing them. They're, uh, they're better than just imposing a price increase because we all understand that the re under stress, the economy is under stress. We're trying to manage this together. So the Competition Commission investigating is absolutely essential. Uh, but my preference would be that we engage, we appreciate that we're in a crisis and we need to manage this together. So I guess what I'm, I'm putting on the table is that it would be possible actually for retailers and the Competition Commission, uh, you, you know, in other words, government and the economy to be dealing with this collectively, not, not ex post, not competition commission looking for price gouging after the fact, being honest with each other around the information about the pressures we're confronting and how we deal with it. Now, Professor, global trends, uh, you know, suggest that food prices will increase year on year, affecting the welfare of households, particularly the poorer households. And uh, yet salaries um, are not increasing. And uh, we've seen in the past few months uh, that uh, South Africans taking a pay cut as a result of this coronavirus pandemic. Do you think there is a robust plan in place to ensure that food security is not affected as a result of this? No, so I'm sure there's not a robust plan in place. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to put in place in our country because uh, food is produced and supplied predominantly by the market. Um, and uh, so I think there's a lot of, there's quite a lot of thinking going on, but we, we are in a situation where we've gone big on, you know, on the production of food ourselves because we're very privileged in that way. And so we can do better. And uh, I think that we can deal with this issue much, much better than other countries because we produce most of, most of the food that we need we produce in this country and we can produce more. We can shift production into producing as much of the food as possible. Uh, but actually getting people to produce their own food, which is clearly on the table in the food security issue and small smallholder agriculture, et cetera, that's, that's going to take quite a while to get in place. And so key for now is understanding the production systems, improving them, and making sure we can do better than the rest of the world in keeping the increases in food prices down. You say that South Africans producing their own food will take quite a while to happen, but will it ever happen though in South Africa, uh, seeing at the uh, socio-political climate that we find ourselves in uh, with regards to uh, the, the lack of means of production for most South Africans? Yes, uh, perfectly put. Um, uh, it will happen, yes. Uh, and already, I mean, already there are amazing stories uh, from our, our South Africans that are very inspiring. You know, in, in township economies, people starting uh, gardens, hydroponics, all sorts of ingenuity that's quite incredible. Uh, and then there's a lot of work being done on the smallholder agriculture itself as, as part of the land reform discussion in this country. Uh, what would it take? to not just um, redistribute land, but get the land productively used in a way that's really of help in alleviating uh, the hunger in this country. And there is that discussion. It, it requires uh, some boldness from government, but the evidence is there on what, what it would require. And there's quite substantial land that's available for that. 
that sort of redistribution. A lot of good work done by, by uh, the people at, uh, at class at the University of the Western Cape. Those plans are on the table. Uh, the department is engaging with those plans. My point was just that that's going to take a while to put in place. All right, Professor, thank you so much for your time and more so because uh, some researchers say that uh, food insecurity should be flagged as a market failure as the free market economy is seen to be socially inefficient. M many thanks for your thoughts there, Professor. Okay, that's a pleasure. That was Professor Mari Lebrant, who is the director of the Southern Africa Labour and Development Research Unit at the University of Cape Town.